All right, everybody, and let's get this party started. Um, welcome, if you're tuning in uh, for the first time, to an episode of So How'd You Get Here. I'm Angelo. I'm Tony. This is Tony. Mm -hmm. And today, uh, before we introduce our guest, uh, I'm going to throw out a couple accolades. Um, oh, oh. Introduce him. He is a stand-up comic, a writer, an impressionist. Yes. He also, um, I just recently learned, um, is a pet food tester, a professional. Wow. wow. Check. Must be true because I read it on Wikipedia. Wikipedia. All the boxes. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to introduce somebody I'm a huge fan of and grew up watching religiously, Mr. Dana Carvey. How the hell are you? I just want to say I love the setup here and I love the idea of the podcast, but a little just gentle feedback. How did you get here might be kind of limiting because I just went... I went down Melrose. Okay. <laughs> this is going to be a quick one, okay? Yeah. <laughs> I got on the 101. That's I got off see, on Barnum. That's your mistake. We're almost yeah. done with the show. That's it. Then I took a left <laughs> on Hollywood Way. I went straight down. Tony got me in. I went, thank you very much. So that's, uh, that's take one. Uh, how am I doing? Um, uh, really busy in a good way, you know, just busy during the pandemic. Good, very lucky that way. A lot, a lot of Zooming, a lot of... Animation. Well, you told me after about two million podcasts that you decided to start your own. Well, I told my manager, once yeah. there's around two million, I'll jump in, but I'm yeah. not going to go out and be a yeah. fucking guinea pig. You're not going to start them. I'm going to be the guy yeah. who's laying it all out there <laughs> with crickets and two, two listeners. It's very wise. Um, the pipeline's been, you know, but look, people are adopting right now. There is no late. It's like right now, right. my generation, 55 to like 60, so like 56. The boomers. They're starting to get into it. My wife's really into it. Like, no, it gets the, has the process. Okay, she's got like five, ten podcasts she listens to. Right, right, right. You know, and uh, she'll listen to ten-minute ones from Trey Gowdy and stuff, or five-minute ones. And uh, it's, like it's interesting. It's like the TikTok version of podcasts. What's the name of your <laughs> podcast? Because we'd like to plug that. Uh, the, my podcast um, is called uh, Fantastic. 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 Now, that was my the podcast whisperer, which I was talking about on Instagram Live. The podcast whisperer of my podcast is my son, who's in his 20s. So he looks at all of it very different. And it, <laughs> they talk, when I talk to him, my brain has to speed up. Like, if he's on the phone with me, yeah, we could really do that. We could go down to that. That'd be really cool, you know. And I also noticed that uh, when he vapes, he's only positive. Which is oh, really interesting. Yeah. Hey, mom and I are thinking of going to Tahoe. Oh, that'd be really cool. You could go up there. You could rent an Airbnb, but you could water ski or get a ski boat or whatever. I'm thinking of getting a jean jacket. Oh, you could rock anything with it, with a jean jacket. You know, super positive vape guy. Um, so anyway, I uh, well, podcasting. Yeah. So this is great. What you guys are doing. Appreciate yeah. it. Appreciate being you being here. here. You have a very specific brand, which I've said is nice. Yeah. How'd you get here? And uh, I always felt that as a kid because i had little hidden dreams about being in show business and someone would be on merv griffin or johnny right and there'd be a little biographical thing well then i started singing and then rca gave me a record deal whoa 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 whoa, whoa. what happened Between i wanted like literally yes. yeah how do you get there you That's know. what this is. Like, we understand mm -hmm. what it is once you've probably made it and you start to blow up and we can read yeah. about that. But what about what about before that when you slept on a friend's couch or had to borrow money from your parents or maybe move back in or sleep in your car or you got fired? Like, give us the uh, give us the good stuff. And what was that age group? Like, you were like, was it high school? Were you already doing impressions? Like, you wanted no, to do stand I started, up? Uh, um, basically, I had three older brothers, a younger sister, all packed together. So it's 1963. Or four, uh, the we had the the real story is <laughs> we had a LP from Caller's Encyclopedia. Okay, review of the year, so we could play it over and over again. And the Beatles were being interviewed on the very end of it. You just you could hear them talking and talking and talking. So I'm eight or nine, ten, and then a little while later I realized just sitting around with my brothers on a rainy day that I could still you know I, I was able to do the voice. You know, Ed, we're doing the best we can, Ed. Yeah. So that was, like, <laughs> revolutionary. Wait a minute, what the fuck? The little brother just, you know, he's, I was going to beat him up. He's doing Paul McCartney. I was going to beat him up and <laughs> give him a wedgie, but what's he doing? So that was the first time I thought I could alter my voice. And then I became... And make people laugh. like And, and, and get the approval of your older brothers. Oh, yeah. I went, yeah. Up, I went up to my mom right. in the morning. Hey, mom, do you think you could make me some pancakes? You know, <laughs> ah, I'm so talented. Oh, my God. And you got the pancakes, right? 
Well, pancakes were rough because my dad had this ego about being the pancake guy on weekend mornings. But he would pour like an inch of oil in the pan and get it all bubbly. So the first two or three batches, he called them the Krispies because they were just with bubbled, soaking hot oil. And then he decided that Dane, me, oh, oh, Jesus Christ. This is my best impression of my dad. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ, Dane loves the Krispies. So he put this mound of gooey, and we couldn't afford maple syrup. We had caro syrup because it oh. was cheaper, the white stuff with ants around it. Yeah. It's protein, <laughs> you little shit. So uh, anyway, I started in the 60s just casually thinking I could maybe be in show business. And by the time I was in fifth grade, what do you want to do with your life? And I wrote down, be a comedian and make 100000 a year. Well, lofty goals in 1965. Missed it by that much. Yeah. <laughs> you overshot <laughs> added a, it. Added a couple of zeros. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but, Quit bragging. Uh, <laughs> dreams can be true. It's been a rut, but it took a while. I um, was very introverted. I had years where I was extroverted. Maybe you guys can relate to that. Yeah. Like fifth grade, I was the cool kid. Seventh grade, I was dormant. That kind of stuff. Right. Um, in seventh grade, these were the messages I was getting from the universe. In seventh grade, I thought it was too much to run for president, but I ran for secretary of the class. And so the gymnasium is packed. This is baby boomer time, like 600 kids. I'm going to go out really scared and give a speech running for secretary. Yeah. So, so it's like a gig to me. So the first thing I did was I taped together like, Tons of eight by ten lined paper. You know, I taped them all together and rolled them up. So I had like them a scroll. Yeah. So I <laughs> okay. had them on the top of the podium, and I said, "I I won't. I only have a few remarks to make." And then I pushed it, and it unrolled off this thing. <laughs> oh. so that was my first laugh. And you, oh, you got him. You got him with the laugh. And then it was Tierra Linda. TL was the name of the school. You know, I'm not a Democrat. I'm not a Republican. I'm a TL again, and I promise more. Drinking fountains. That was my <laughs> platform. You, you run on more. Your platform was more drinking fountains. You will never go, go more than 10 feet. Yes. There won't be thirst in my time. Did you do a dance like Napoleon Dynamite on stage or anything? Not that time. Okay, but, okay. but I did get laughs. And yeah. then, um, so then I went along like that. I got into distance running in high school. So my father was a track coach. Okay. And it was slight. So we had a really great team. And I had a lot of friends that had great sense of humor. But as a junior, the, one of the coaches' car broke down, a big banquet on the campus with all the teams are there and all the parents. Hey, whatever's car broke down, will you talk about the junior varsity cross-country team? Ask me five minutes before. So I went up, and then I realized I'd had little impressions of certain right. guys on the team. Jeff Green would always say, if I could only get my form down. That was his thing. He was horrible, but I need to get my form. So I did that and got big laughs. Uh, so that was another message to me, but still tried to go to an acting class way too shy. Did you ever do drama? Like no, no, I could, no, couldn't. No, it was too scary. So it was impressions around your friends, family, people that thought you were Characters. Yeah. So then in junior, junior high, it became junior, no, um, junior in high school. No, this, then it became junior college. Years. Oh, junior college. Yeah. We all went to junior college. I didn't know anyone who went to a, a, a four-year school. Yeah. No, it was insane. Well, yeah. you go to, it was cheap. And then my friends started smoking pot, and I'd be back of the, back of the Volkswagen bu bug, and I would be riffing. You know, I had like a Star Trek thing, or I had a John Wayne impression. Just goofy yeah. stuff. And then I'd be normal. No one ever said to me, you should be in comedy. It wasn't that obvious, you know. Um, so then... I just moved out at age 20 into a shithole near the airport in San Francisco because my brother had a room uh, in a duplex. My rent was $58. Jeez. It came with a water bed. <laughs> it came with the water bed? Yeah. 58 steel. Yeah, because my steel. brother Done. and his friend, Bob Shug, they lived in the other room. So they paid like $25 a month. They, they worked at a steakhouse during the day, and they would steal baked potatoes. And then we would get tuna pies from Safeway, 25 cents with the crust on top. And, the ba you know, so we, we were living, living large, right near the airport. Living the dream. And we literally, in Wayne's world, we went to the airport and we would sit on the hood of the car. We did that, too. Oh, okay. Yeah, we did it right down the runway, and we had It's It's, these things called It's It's, which was giant cholesterol bombs of ice cream. And <laughs> so at that point, I was just playing a lot of risk, smoking pot, and I took a night class at San Francisco State, you know. 
I got out of there, and I knew I was living cheap enough. I was a busboy at the Holiday Inn um, and then a waiter at that time. And frequently enough, when I was a room service busboy, I waited on the Jackson family for a week. I, wow. Yes, Michael and uh, would always get raw carrots before his show, and I'd go to the room, and I'd bring him his raw carrots, <laughs> and he would be sitting and just staring into the mirror. And I, I remember one time. So I this is know, like kid Michael, though. Yeah, this is yeah. Michael as a teenager. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, this little cute little girl was jumping up and down on the bed all the time. Janet. And I said, Janet, don't do that. And she said, Miss Jackson, if you please. So that's where that <laughs> came from. <laughs> With Michael, I just said, you could do a little something. You're a very handsome guy, but you could maybe do a little bit. And I regret that to this day. <laughs> I waited on Little Richard. He opened the door. He was stark naked. Have you been to see the show? <laughs> I waited on Richard Pryor. Oh. Gave him a Denver omelet. I waited on George Carlin. Um, anyone who played this little Was this the Waldorf Astoria of San Francisco? Like, where were you? There was a 3,000-seat theater called the Circle Star Theater 20 miles south of San Francisco on the peninsula. And that's where all these people would play. Got it. You know, I saw Don Rickles there uh, just as a kid. And it was the most exciting thing ever and the thing i always remember i don't know if you guys can relate to this was when the lights go down little 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 timpani drum and now star blah, 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 right. don rickles and then watching this person you'd seen on television animated in three dimensions walking out you know the night i saw it ed sullivan was in the audience Ooh. ancient ed and so rickles just ripped him I mean, it was incredible. Rickles hilarious. was the best. Yeah. Look at you. Yeah. Okay, back. Ed, wake up. The show's on. Here's some ice. You know. I grew up watching him and then Foster Brooks and then Dean. Like, I love those guys. Yeah. Just the roasts that they would do. The, the old, those old-fashioned yeah. comedians. And, uh, you know, he just beat them up. And then they brought a birthday cake out and brought Ed Sullivan up. And he just said, Don Rickles, you can kiss my ass. And that was, I remember that. So I'm like 20, 21. But so, still no inclination of, like, I want to be that guy on stage? Yes, but hidden and secret. Got it. So you know that you have, like, you're working on it secretly, but you're also seeing it can be done as a profession, and you're just trying to make that leap. Yeah, it seemed like outer space, like trying to be an alien or get on the moon or be president of the United States. But what happened was I didn't know anything about it, and I saw something in the local paper, San Francisco Chronicle. And in the entertainment section. So it was a little article about stand-up comedy um, at, in Berkeley at La Sal uh, the La Salamandra Cafe. And it's Saturday night, you know. And I, didn't even, I skipped San Francisco. I got two friends with me. Let's go over there to the comedy show. So we went over to Telegraph Avenue, went into this hippie bakery dive. And in the back, there was a chalkboard, $1 cover, 20 people in the audience, maybe. We're just sitting there. Uh, comedians are coming up that aren't famous. And I know some of them even to this day, Mark Miller, and there was a guy named Mitch Krug, and they were just uh, good at that time, but not intimidating. So I took a paper out of my pocket or a napkin, started making notes of little bits that I would do, uh, thinking. Once they, the napkin and the paper comes out, y you're in. Yeah, once you're, you're writing on, it down. Um, yeah, <laughs> well, because they said after the show, at 11, you can do open mic. Oh. I didn't even know that was going to exist. So then I had a couple beers. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm waiting. And then, then this guy comes up, and he's sort of like, whoa, uh, I'm, what's this? <laughs> and he's moving around the stage. He's so confident, and he seems to be completely spontaneous. Um, he's not really even on mic a lot. And I'm like, so then I put, I folded up the napkin and put it in my pocket. Because I thought, oh. Is this an open mic guy? or No, comedian? this was part of the little oh, show. Okay. He's, he's getting paid $2. Okay. He's this far from an open mic guy. Right, right, right. So I put the napkin back in my pocket going, hmm, uh, ha, huh, okay. Maybe there's a lot of this guy. It was Robin Williams. Jeez. So Robin Williams Her. was the $2 guy. He was a $2 guy. Oh, look. And then he just had <laughs> stuff like he had a beret, and he'd hold it up. Oh, for those of you on acid, this is a Frisbee. Ha, <laughs> oh, Don't be afraid. So... They said, I went up afterwards and I bombed, but I, every time my things would bomb, because there's like four people there, I would just say, moving right along. Somehow it came out funny. The guy said, do you want to come back and just be the MC?" He couldn't believe it was my first time. Yeah. So him saying that to me at that time was about as high as I'd ever been. Because I'd harbored this, I harbored this thing I wanted to do from age nine 
and it just trundled along. But no one grabbed me by the lapel and said, damn it, kid, you belong in show business. You right. know? I even had a girlfriend when I told her about it. She goes, really? <laughs> You know, we broke you're, up. You're, that you're, doesn't help the relationship. You're, you're, not, my wife, you're not that funny. But my wife grew to love what I do. No, that one was not the one. Do you find that that's actually... <laughs> I, <laughs> Seriously? You? On television? No, go but ahead. But is that... <laughs> that seems to be more of the common thing where no one grabs you and says, you're going to... You're it. It's no. mostly people working really hard, getting a few little nuggets of hope. Yes, and I... Or that one person being like, the, like the, hey, you want to MC? You're pretty funny. You might have something. Paul Miles was his name. And uh, so I came back two weeks later, and I brought the Peninsula, just middle-class white kids, suburban kids, never been anywhere. So basically, like, 15 friends of friends, because it was, Matt, a guy's going to do comedy from San Carlos? It's like, in Berkeley? Count me in. So we, you know, I, I walked first through the front door, and the chalkboard was there, and it, it was Saturday. So it was like, I guess it was a one or it was $2 in chalk. And the guy next to the chalkboard, who was kind of part of the show, he looked up, saw all these suburban kids coming in, dressed all nice, and I saw him quickly erase it and put $3. Ah, <laughs> smart, smart. I That's why that. it's in chalk. <laughs> it's in chalk. It's adjustable. So then I started on the road of not doing well, being nervous, occasionally having a good night. I found my way to San Francisco to the Holy City Zoo, which was a mainstay. There was no comedy clubs. Oh. But this was a music club. But on Tuesday night, you'd have stand-up. And Robin was always the guy floating above everybody at this other level, kind of like a guy who studied Shakespeare and then decided – to be a stand-up, yeah. so he married those two things and created this incredible. But when you saw him live, were you like, I don't know if I can do what he does? Oh, oh, I was completely intimidated yeah. by him. His confidence, you know, like Eddie Murphy at twenty, um, Robin, right then I think he was twenty-five or six, really confident, really confident. At least the way he appeared to me right. on stage, I found I got to know him a lot better over the years. Um, and was I his think, stage persona s similar in real life, or was he not as on all the time? Oh, no. He could be very, very shy and quiet. Uh, okay. Oh, yeah. And very uh, self-deprecating, really hard on himself, you know, uh, and very, uh, very vulnerable, mm. you know. I really got to know him a lot better. I was so intimidated by him. We were like two batteries that repelled. I could not really even – he was too much magic to me, Yeah. you know. And I never – the only thing he did drive me, because then he went to L.A. pretty quickly – then he's on work in Mindy and all this, you know? Yeah, so I got to work with, my best friend worked with Gary up until he had passed away, and mm. he told me the the uh, Mork and Mindy story. Mm -hmm. It was actually Happy Days, and they needed a character that could square off with Fonz. And yeah. and his son was like, well, I really want to see aliens. I would I would like the show more <laughs> if there was an alien. And he goes, really, aliens? Aliens, really? That's what <laughs> you want? Uh, all what right. are you going to do with an alien? Exactly. So <laughs> he got a standing ovation. He mm -hmm. guess he did the whole interview on his head like his before the show. His audition, yeah. And then he got a, f I think Gary got a phone call th before the first episode, that episode was done. Yeah. Execs called and said, T who is this guy? Right. And do you have a series written for him? And he went, yeah, of course I do. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to you next week. Hangs up and goes, we got to write a pilot. <laughs> I mean, and yeah, he's just, no, I from, love that. just took off from like, he I always seemed to have like stripper glitter just coming out of his, out of his. Well, it was, it was just such an exotic choice yeah. when he came into the comedy store. You'd see guys with material. And then he was like an improv player. He would just go, uh, suddenly he's in the audience. Oh, look, oh, hey, oh, needs hair, whatever. It was just <laughs> all this, the, 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 the conceit of it, of a Shakespearean actor with no material hmm. coming out. And over time, you saw his, he had his tricks like all of us, yeah. you know. But uh, that was hard to follow and hard to then go up and be like, okay, how you doing, everybody? And he's like, right away, oh, look, a spaceship. Oh, oh <laughs> come in, Captain, come in, Captain. <laughs> you know. So that, he was very inspiring. And for a while, I tried to be him. And huh. this is in the 70s. You know, I, I had a trunk with props. For, for a Wait, year, you were the first carrot top? <laughs> <laughs> well, I had little glasses. I was so scared. And my confidence was so low from being beaten up, literally and figuratively, from my childhood. And wow. so insecure. Uh, Dude, I really I never that. had a girlfriend. You know, and the uh, one you did have didn't think you were funny. Yeah, you're gonna go do that, <laughs> huh? Yeah, oh, that's good. Great. Yeah, you're funny, all right. 
<laughs> Good luck. Did you send her a picture of your first residual? <laughs> that was my mother. Oh, that was your <laughs> 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 no, my mom was a big fan of uh, all her kids. My brother became a musician, and I would open for his band. This is in Because you grew up playing drums, right? I read that. You got a drum kit pretty pretty young. Yes. Uh, I asked, well, initially couldn't get one, so I had a Hardy Boys book. That was my uh, snare drum. <laughs> and we had a clothes hamper. We, initially, we were into the, my brother, who I, he was, we shared a room, bunk beds. He bought a guitar for a dollar. I guess it had two strings on it. And I would kick the clothes hammer for my kick drum, but I needed drumsticks. Mm. So we started shoplifting. So <laughs> we didn't have any money. So we were just, I was stealing on Laurel Avenue in San Carlos from a drum store called Hearts Drums. I was on occasion very cleverly getting out of there with a couple of drumsticks. Flash 25, no, 30 years later, I'm at the Four Seasons in Manhattan. And suddenly I'm at a table with the Grateful Dead. And Mickey Hart is there. And he starts talking about his past. Hey, Mickey, very affable guy. And uh, I go, wait a minute. You, you own Hart's drums on Laurel? Yeah, me and my dad, 65 to 67. Oh. I owe you a couple, couple well, I dollars. Had, I handed him a 20 and said, oh, you know, it was like, yeah, I, I harvested that store. He goes, I was yeah. going to say, you were incriminating yourself, but you've made But it, he was like, we it. would do the books at the end of the month and everything. We go, ah, there's like 40 drumsticks we're not accounted for. There's no, the ledger. So they hired a separate accountant. He had a quick nervous breakdown and then joined Grateful Dead. No, he didn't have a nervous breakdown. <laughs> but. So the, um, then I evolved to, I had a uh, plastic snare drum begging my parents and my cousin who was kind of a muscly guy, he's 10 years old, just broke it in a second. But next door was a guy who owned a music store. And so there was, they were going to throw out this drum set, but my dad paid like 20 bucks. So I got a drum set at age 14 and I did play in garage bands and that was, you know, my thing. And are you, j and at that point, is that helping or conflicting with the, the part of you that's like, I still think I maybe want to do comp. Not mu really. Music, mm -hmm. I feel, is a little more acceptable, maybe, for right. parents oh, versus yeah. stand up yeah, comic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, Because there always easy. be like, where did we go wrong? I had no fear of uh, the drum thing. It even wasn't really my dream compared to the comedy, but it was just super fun. And to get into a small room with someone on bass and someone on, on a guitar, and my <laughs> brother got better and jamming and stuff, it's really just fun. I would love to do it to this day. You know, just too busy. Oh, drum kit right over there. Uh, that's a yeah. biggie. Yeah. That's a big one. <laughs> Help yourself right after. So anyway, and then I got on Saturday Night Live. No. Um, <laughs> just a long, how much time have we got? As much as you want, we'll sir. We'll be right you, you till are, tomorrow. You are the only person here today. Mm. On purpose. Okay, <laughs> so so, uh, so I'm basically, uh, um, I'm 20, then 21 when I started doing this. Still uh, just emceeing? M scene and then would go open mic to the, you know, get spots at Holy City Zoo. And occasionally I'd have a good set and then I'd bomb a lot. Were you doing these impressions, these, these, uh, um, the Beatles and, and those? And characters. Yeah. You know, I uh, was looking, I was trying to buy material. I didn't know how to write material. So, like, there was this uh, cologne that on the back of it, it said something funny. So I, I, I kept the box and I held it up and, Jovan, and I just read what it said with sort of a funny attitude, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I had a box of Petridge Farm, and I did a little New Hampshire guy, Petridge Farm, week, <laughs> and I said that made the ingredients really poisonous or something. <laughs> um, I got some yellow, just some f f crazy sunglasses, and I did an agent from L.A., Dana, babe, how are you? <laughs> but I was so scared to become a character like, I could do it for a second, but then I would retreat back. Right. I just was so fledgling, so nervous, with no background, no knowledge. But I got better over time. And then in but 1977... It sounds like you're finding, your, like, you're seeing what works and then keeping it and throwing away what doesn't yeah, work. Yeah, I'm doing... Yes, exactly. I mean, if you... There are comedians who will... And back in the day, there'd be people, like, they'd have bits that weren't working. And we they wouldn't improve They death. wouldn't improve them. Yeah. And they wouldn't jettison them. <laughs> so it's like game over. So there's a stand-up comedy competition that still goes on to this day, but it was huge in San Francisco in the 70s. And so I, jo I went into that in 1977. And there were rounds, and there were clubs you would go to, and it goes on for weeks. And there's the quarterfinals and the semifinals. So I was getting more kind of quality stage time than I'd ever gotten. So I was getting better as I went along. 
And then I managed to make the final. So of like 60 comedians, it was the final five. Mm. But I needed 15. I only had 10. <laughs> so, so, so these are really six, six, long jokes. Well, yeah. Oh, you mean amount of jokes? It, amount of of time. My time as a set. stand-up, I had like 10 minutes of yeah. all the best things, throwing them out there. But you had to go 15 was your for, set. For the final, Got they it. required 15. So I came up with this bit that was kind of rhythmic, I think influenced by Steve Martin. It was a singles bar kind of guy. What do you do? You work, you go to school, or what? And then it's like, oh, well, how long were you behind bars? <laughs> well, you know what? We have a lot in common. You went, you were behind bars. I hang out at bars. Hey, tiny world, you know, said better than what I just said it. But it became a rhythmic character performance. And Sorry, sorry, rhythmic character performance. Character we'll pick right up with that. Give one second. Uh, we are uh, climbing out of 200 feet. We're having a little bit of sputter in the left engine, but we're going to continue on anyway. <laughs> Why is that light coming on? <laughs> yeah. Uh, we have some heat uh, issues up here. Uh, we're going to circle around. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the plane's on fire. Um, three, two, one. That, yeah. All right, we're clear. Go ahead. We're continue. clear. Um, so anyway, so I did that, and because the favorite, Mark McCollum, was a very good impressionist with a guitar, Went overtime. He was out. I went on third, which is the best out of five that you can get warmed up, but not. And so I won by like three hundredths of a point. There were judges and everything, you know. Were the judges famous people? Um, I'm not. Yeah, they might have been. I, I, there was also. Or they cl comedy club owners from all over the that, country. That or kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's a picture that exists of me standing there. At age 22, just have won that thing, which levitated me to the moon. And behind me is Mort Saul and Robin Williams. And then they came up and presented the check with me. And then 35 years later, or whatever it was, Mort Saul moved to Marin County, where I have a house where there's a small theater. And Robin moved back up there the last five years of his life. So the three of us would get together. And so anyway, one of those kismity yeah. things. But winning that was huge. But there still was no comedy clubs, no way to make money. I was doing another year at San Francisco State, just phoning it in, literally. Does it get you <laughs> representation? Like, how did it no. work back then? No? Nothing. Nothing. Just nothing. Just a check. <laughs> 500 bucks. Yeah. I bought a guitar, I think. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and a lot of weed. Quite. <laughs> I, I never was that into the weed. Oh, uh, okay. But, but, but I, there was a point where I just, like, I'm anxious and paranoid. What? It, yeah. You know. So, <laughs> question on, like. But I did smoke it occasionally. The nerves and the same thing. Like, that was the same for me, starting dance, like, terrified, but always mm -hmm. wanted to do it um did you find small things like that where you victories where you won a contest you got some money yeah that actually helped boost confidence or did it have nothing to do with that and you had to keep working something else it did boost the confidence but what i found out later like you'd get gigs that were not official comedy clubs so i'm suddenly i'm in a basement i'm playing there's a little stage suddenly i'm with other comedians we're the comedy show during dinner so i'm paying i'm playing to people who are talking and facing away with Right, not paying attention to you. And waiters. <laughs> yeah. But bombing and then feeling bad. Later uh, on, I, I realized when I got up to bed in a normal like club, the audience wasn't drunk, they're facing me. They wanted lot, to be there to laugh. A lot easier. Yeah. But what happened was in 78, there were no comedy clubs, no way to leverage that or anything. I finished college, just phoning it in. It was San Francisco State at those days. You know, I literally would just write the term paper during the class <laughs> and say typewriter broken. <laughs> Oh, you got to be. I mean, I did, <laughs> at that point, after this, okay, I'm going to go down this path after I won that comedy competition. But that year, the only thing that was open was opening for bands. Huh. So I have 50 bucks at the old Waldorf, 600 seater. I opened for Todd Rundgren. I opened for uh, Robert Palmer. And they're having you do a 10 minute set, five yeah. minute set? Your hero will be here in a second, 10 minutes. But please welcome. Uh, Dana Garno. <laughs> I'd walk out, boo, fuck you. Literally, the whole people in front, fuck you. <laughs> just, it was just, I'd sit on the amp and just take the heat, you know. Um, but I, you know, this, I had a few voices. I could survive, but feeling bad a lot. That, yeah. You know, my big work a day thing was Jimmy Stewart as a waiter back then. <laughs> yeah, well, can I take your order? Yeah. Well, 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 I, well I, you. <laughs> well, when are you going to order? I've I got 10 other tables here. Now, tell you really. <laughs> well, what, 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 I, I've, I said the specials to you a half hour ago. What? 
Well, fuck you too. <laughs> and that never didn't I work. I wish I could. <laughs> I wish I could say that. To yeah, people. you probably yeah, you yeah. just have it on a. Yeah. Yeah, I'll record it for you. Perfect. Go, it's a friend of mine. It's a friend of mine. Yeah. I'm not saying it. Yeah. He's saying yeah. it. Yeah. Fuck you too. <laughs> so then, um, comedy clubs started to be built. There mm. was a revolution and a renaissance in comedy. This because early '80s. No, this is '79. '79. Okay. Because you had. Robin was exploding. Well, I was just going to ask you about Robin real quick. So sure. he's he's on Mork and Mindy, yeah, in L.A. But coming back and forth. So all you the never time. had any inkling, like, oh, maybe I should go to L.A. Maybe that's where it's happening. Did that not cross your mind? Yeah, it did, and it, it comes up pretty quickly in the story. Okay. <laughs> oh, sorry. Way to interrupt him, Tony. Sorry, sorry, sorry. No, no, not at all. All it, right, the, the story's ruined. This, Don't this even is like is it? Yeah. This story. Thanks for coming. Appreciate you. I've <laughs> often thought of this story uh, as a, a book. Okay. Just this, not an autobiography, but just basically from maybe the stand-up comedy comedy from seventy-six to eighty-six. Okay, because that was that ten years. So now we're at three years into it, and uh, the clubs are being built. So there's a there's a laundry mat you know, on the hate hate Ashbury in the hate that they convert into a small comedy club. I learned later that small rooms were really really good for me. As I got more famous, I'm playing these giant rooms. And doing all these characters and attitudes, and I'm leaning and pushing and screaming. Then when I got, came back, I was to comedy with my sons. We play in these small rooms. I go, it's a different sport. Mm. It's like podcasting. I can be subtle. I can be weird. So anyway, so they're building, and this room in particular became my home. This room is where I developed. Paula Poundstone came through there, developed a lot. She came from Boston. Bobcat Goldthwait, Robin would play in there. And Paula was friends with your wife, correct? Paula Poundstone, well, my wife and I were together, but not married. We met Paula Poundstone, loved her, brilliant comedian, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, uh, just outrageous improviser, and it, her whole vibe and everything. And so we, uh, she never had any money, so we had rented a two-bedroom house on Cabrillo Street off Golden Gate Park. Mm -hmm. So we, we had her live with us. Oh, and, that's um, nice of you. I know, and we had paid a rent. I was working a little bit at that point, a little bit. I played clubs that were just open, Laughs Unlimited in Sacramento. And they go, can you headline? I go, I'll try. So <laughs> then I got a, I had my guitar. Ouch. So then I'm going to fill material with the guitar. I'm going to do everything I can to find my way to 45 minutes. That's innocent times. Meanwhile, the other cafe was, it'll, it happened gradually over time. What's where Church Lady came from? Chopping Broccoli came from because you do, I would started to do seven shows in a row with a not drunk audience, a hippie audience, kind of educated. There was a giant picture window out on the street. So people would walk by and the whole audience could see them. So then I'm improvising with that guy, you know. Nice. So it's, it's yeah. really developing me, the other cafe in San Francisco. So then. Is um, that still in existence? No. No. But it's funny. Well, I talk about a Twilight Zone. So my son, and I guess his girlfriend at the time, we were going around San Francisco. So we go to the hate. And we go into where the other cafe is. Now it's back to something else. I don't know if it's a laundromat or another type of cafe, not a comedy club. And it was almost like Rod Taylor in the time machine. Because I remember the first time I saw my wife, I was at one side of the club. She, was, she had come in, and we both remember the exact second our eyes met. So I was able, no one was in the place. I said, your mom was here, and I was over here occupying this space 30-some years, or 30 years later, whatever later. And that was where we, our eyes first met. And she had never been to a comedy club. Oh. And that's where we met. Huh. But her and her friends were such fans of mine, they had T-shirts made that said, uh, no, the T-shirt <laughs> was, uh, <laughs> what do you do? You work, you go to school, or what? And then on the back it said, tiny, tiny world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so that was, that was that. First so you married stanza. a fan. Interesting. Well, let me get that. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. She was a. Uh, 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 yeah. Well, she just laughed. We'd go to her parents' house. They were upstairs. One was Irish. One was Dutch. And they would just hear murmur, murmur, murmur. And then she'd laugh, laugh, laugh. You know, incredible sense of humor. So there was. Uh, oh, pause. Can I ask one question? Sure. From sure. Yeah. So feel free to interrupt me. I'm just going. Well, I don't want to. You're yeah, stuck. If you're People curious. want to hear you, not us. Um, but if you're curious, um, more detail. What is your preferred now, having gone the whole gambit? Do you prefer still small room, 15 minute set, or do you like forum, 
two hour set or whatever. Like oh, that whole scale. Wh- which what's your personal taste right now? My personal taste would be podcasts. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, that's how we got them. That's how we got them. That's em. how we got them. Right here. Um, a lot of when you when you get to be a name and you're traveling, a lot of is you you just like say I had a corporate date for a ton of money in Orlando. So just say I'm not in this case flying private. But you get to the airport, dip about it. So it's like 12 hours to get to the hotel room in Orlando of just that slog with everything all considered. And then you wait for the show. And then you do the show, and they're all talking and drinking. There's a gigantic room with screens. And you do a meet and greet afterwards, sweating. I got you in a headlock. It's fine, <laughs> you know, with good money. Next day you get up early. You know, you're just exhausted. And then you fly back. And over time, you don't even remember the show. Hmm. It's irrelevant. So to me, if you're a what I call a, a prosecuting attorney, stand up, a plaintiff. So you're somebody that generally you're on your toes with the audience going. You know, it's not like Bill Burr is like a very he could really work a big room. Yeah, right. we saw him at you the know, forum. Here yeah, ago. these fucking guys. <laughs> you know, it drives me nuts. Meet them, mates. The fuck. <laughs> Get a car. Fucking think gone around. So it's like, and he's brilliant. You know. Great, you know, I had dinner with him at Koi yeah. during the pandemic in the secret room. <laughs> we don't repeat. Um, so those those kinds of people, I think Chris Rock, you know, is very powerful. But for me, when I'm just going, you know, really, I'm trying to do, you know, Biden or something. Here's the deal, folks. You know, it's the forum. You know, can't hear me. So then you have to. So I like the smaller rooms gotcha. for stand up. Uh, yeah, like a like a a hundred seater with low ceilings, like powerful. You know, nice. It feels more intimate, too, it sounds like, which is more your brand of what you want to do. I'm trying to kick out rhythms and get ev- and, and repeat them and get people infected by them because that's what I liked in high school and college. You know, I like those kind of ideas <laughs> that um, if someone walked into the room at a given point, they wouldn't know why everyone was laughing. Uh-huh. So the, what, I've, what I did naturally, I think most comedians do naturally, even before they learn how to do stand-up, is repeat a lot. So you, you're doing the water polo coach impression, then you're doing it again, and then you're back, you're go- and you keep going, you know. Um, so that's what I like to do, and that's good in a small room. Right. right makes right. sense. Makes that sense. makes sense. All right. So back to 1978. Sorry. It's blowing up. 79. 79. I'm getting in the club. I'm getting, I'm getting better. I'm getting better. I had one. There was another little club called Mustard Seed Cafe. This is like late 78, 79. This is a little tiny tuss, taste of Hollywood. Um, so that was 50 seaters downstairs. No drinking, just tables. So George Slaughter, who invented Laugh-In, his, he and his people were going to do a new Laugh-In revival, which Robin Williams ended up being on. And he came to San Francisco to look for more talent. I don't think I knew he was there. I had a Star Trek bit. A couple things were working. And so for me at that time, I killed. It's like, whoa. And then all of a sudden, well, come down to L.A., son. Let's come down and we'll hang out. I didn't even know what that meant. So it's like for two weeks, I'm nervous. I've got to go to L.A. to meet with George Slaughter about being on the new Laugh-In. I'm 23. And I remember even then my mom or something or me, we, I bought a corduroy suit. <laughs> and I would w- w- wear T-shirts, but I had a, a corduroy suit. with a cor- I, I, I didn't know what I was doing. It was sweating. I'm in L.A. I'm sweating this like, corduroy like, suit. It's July. I had a vest, corduroy, <laughs> a corduroy jacket, desert boots, like – I go into you the screamed new guy. Got it. I go into the interview, and there's a few uh, women, people there, his sidekick, co-producer, whatever. I thought it was like a serious interview for a job at IBM or something. So I didn't do any shtick. I was just serious and shy. I didn't have any idea. the The girlfriend I had at the time, who was uh, like five foot ten, the and, same one who didn't and, think you were funny. No, this one was okay. She's uh, her name was Missy. She was Russian. Anyway, she knew a lot of Hollywood people. All of a sudden, I'm in L.A. I go to George Slaughter. That goes poorly. I have a spot at the comedy store. The, the one was at, it was in Westwood. I'm really nervous. It's packed, and I've got a spot, and I follow a guy, and I didn't know what to do when it wasn't going right, where you just forget the material, start working the crowd. Epic bomb. I mean, epic. Drenched straight through, dead silence. Then I have to get off the stage. We're th- I'm in a booth near the stage. The girlfriend at the time is sitting there. I'm humiliated. I sit down next to her. Unless I imagine it, she's scooched over. 
just a little bit Ooh. away from you. Yeah. Then they put up Kid Dynamite, JJ, who was the sitcom. Oh, uh, yeah, JJ Walker. JJ Walker. Yeah. They put him up so that because I was so bad, they thought they thought that I would walk the room. That I, I offend, that people would just leave. leave I just can't. Leave. Dave, yeah. If that's the best you've got, I'm out of here. <laughs> and then he went up and he said, "Watch how it's done, kid." Ouch. No. Man. So that was like, that was rough. So then I go back to San Francisco and I'm doing the clubs and then my confidence is building and I'm getting a bit of a following at the at the other cafe, and I'm starting to get better and better and better. Um, some NBC people came up, and sort of were looking around again, so. They put me on camera just riffing. And at that time, I kind of had a teen idol look a little bit. You know, I looked like uh, some Sean Cassidy a little bit. Uh -huh. So I wasn't sure what they wanted me for, but they offered me a deal. So I'm 25. We're going to give you $50,000 advance against pilots that you may do for us. Come to Hollywood. You'll be signed by NBC. So that blew my mind. So is that the equivalent to, to a today, like a holding deal that they yeah. get like actors and stuff? Yeah, but for me at the time, 50,000 fucking smack a room. Might as well be 5 million. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so my brother was a fledging musician guy. We moved down together, and we were really fit. We were still very into running. We were like super tan. We wear those little fluorescent shorts with our shirts off, <laughs> and we were super tan. By the way, we're going to pull up that picture when you say that on the podcast. Of us? Yeah. 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 And so we didn't. We moved right into West Hollywood. We didn't know where we were, and we would run around the neighborhood. <laughs> wow! <laughs> yeah. So it was you fine. getting deals all over the place. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We bought a, a better drum set, recording equipment, put it in the garage. We had a little duplex on Gardner Street, and we recorded stuff. So then, in that year, they asked me to do stuff, and I was terrible. I did a. They said, "Oh, you're going to be on the Marie Osmond show, variety show." I am. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so I was on the Marie Osmond show for a few episodes, and um, doing what sketches. Yeah, we, I had this rubber suit on, and we were called the Tumbling Knights, and we would tumble around, and Gavin McLeod was uh, the host, and I would, they were just trying to find something for me to do, so she was up in front of, it was TV land down there, it was a, you know, the studio from Hollywood, she was incredibly nice, so they had some shtick where I interrupt her, and I improvise, we're friends, we've had coffee, and then they had to cut tape, well, she's Mormon, she doesn't drink coffee, so it's like, whoa, I'm sorry, you know, it's like, and then, uh, She's up there doing a duet with Jeff Conway from Taxi, I think. Did he pass away? The one that was so. also in Greece, that guy? I think so. Yeah. Anyway. Look it up right now. They were, they were, did a song, and then they were kissing. And then all the brothers came in, Marie, Marie, and they kept making out. I remember that was really weird. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds weird. <laughs> Marie, what so are you So this is doing? like, what, 1980? 80. Yeah. Yes, passed away, unfortunately, in 2011. Yes, but he was, yeah, he sang great. And, um. Anyway, so then I did that, and all of a sudden, in the meantime, I'm going to the improv and bombing. They had me an 805 set, like with three industry people. Norman Lear loved it, playing to dead silence. So that was the other. Why do you think your comedy was hilarious in San Francisco and L.A. wasn't, like, wasn't the same material? Well, at that point in San Francisco, I would say the other cafe, mm -hmm. I was packing the weekend, se just 70 seats. People were requesting stuff. I was starting to develop reoccurring things. Okay. So they're all like, yeah. You know, then I would go to just walk into the improv at 8.05 on a Tuesday. It's dead, and no one's even in there. Yeah. Mm. So then it was just like, I didn't know what to. Right. But, um, but eventually they had a piano. I did chop broccoli there. Nice. You know? um, so then I get a call. Fred Silverman, head of NBC, wants you to go to New York and play Mickey Rooney's grandson in a sitcom called One of the Boys. So, um, so I get on a plane. Nathan Lane had auditioned in L.A. to play the roommate. We were going to be at, we're in college, and I bring my grandfather, Mickey Rooney, to live with us. So I'm flying with Nathan Lane across the country, getting to know him. Uh, looks like they're going to cast him. He auditions again. So it's us two and Mickey. We're the cast. And Scatman Carruthers. And Meg Ryan played my girlfriend for a few episodes. Sounds like a great show. Did it get picked up? No, it just, uh, it was on Saturday. It had 25 million people and got canceled. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, it's those days. Pre-fractured, you know, there's nothing else to watch. Yeah. Um, that was the crazy experience. So I'm um, in living in New York. I, I didn't know anything. I still was terrified the whole time. Like, I, I rented an apartment on Lexington and 57th Street. Yeah. So they, um, 
and it was pretty nice. It was like seventeen hundred dollars. I was making seventy five hundred a week on the show, so thirty thousand a month. I'm a That's nobody insane. in Manhattan. So they said, "Well, uh, Robert Redford ed- edited Ordinary People in this apartment." <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck? What is that? You, you must be mistaken. <laughs> so then um, I'll go forward six years for a second. I'm doing a movie with Kirk Douglas and, and, and Burt Lancaster right before I get SNL. The director is Jeff Canoe, former editor. So then Jeff Canoe um, said that he had edited Ordinary People. I said, well, where'd you edit it? He goes, well, Bob wanted to edit it on this little apartment on Lexington Avenue. So it was, it so was, it was true. true. Yeah. One of those, what? So it's, it's in Rockefeller Center. We're shooting the sitcom. I'm on the sixth floor shooting this sitcom. The first day we're at a table, Mickey Rooney pulls out a 38 revolver. They're not going to get me. When I walk around New York, I keep it on there. Come on. Oh, yeah, a 38. <laughs> now, Scab Man is there, smokes pot all day long. So you just go in the restroom. It's just weed, 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 weed. Nicest guy in the world. His pot was terrible because my brother came out. It's horrible. So then in those days, we, there was a break in the show. It was the fall of 80 or 81. We went back to San Francisco. So I got a lid of pot to bring to Scatman. Can't believe it. I just put it in my suitcase. I don't, I'm not a drug dealer, but just, <laughs> it's like, and I didn't even smoke pot. So I gave it to, to Scatman. You know, it was really he's such a sweet person. Next day in the elevator, he's still kind of paranoid, you know, from the 1930s. He said, Dana, the music was good. Uh, might I get a pound? <laughs> that was a quote. A My pound? So a pound of weed. Later on, after the show ended, my brother and I drove to L.A. with a gigantic bag of pot, like, <laughs> and and went to Scatman's house in Van Nuys. He played right. songs for us. We were like his there, friends there with Scatman. Yeah. Mickey was um, uh, kind of crazy. One of the craziest people I'd ever met. I was the number, and I did this on Saturday Night Live, and I just did my Mickey impression, and they just wrote it down. And later, years later, Bill Hader said it was the favorite thing he'd ever seen me do on Saturday Night Live. Oh, that's awesome. I was the number one star in the world. You hear me? Bang. <laughs> the world. Now, he said that 10,000 times in the four months we filmed. Literally. I was enormous. He was so bitter, he's like, he said, he, and he was non-sequitur. He's like, Judy Garland never owned a car. You know why? Because they pumped her so full of drugs, they killed her. And he would talk until he ran out of air, one of those guys. I called up the head of Warner Brothers in 1955. I said, this is Mickey Rooney. I need a job. He hung up on me. (laughs) You know, everything was really dark and twisted. He would pull out like $5,000 in cash because he'd been broke for years, but he was doing sugar babies on Broadway. Think I can afford lunch? (laughs) And there's so much. That's a book in itself. Right. So while while you're in New York on this show, were you an SNL fan? Like, were you watching the show? I was possessed by it, and I would ask through a connection, a wardrobe guy, I was able to get up to 8H, where they do SNL, sit in the bleachers, often on Thursday, and watch Joe Piscopo and Eddie Murphy rehearse. So here I was. Wow. Mickey, the first day of read-through, just pointed at me and said, you're the straight man. So I was just a completely straight, wearing a sweater, asking questions. What are you guys doing? Where are you going? I finally would just add up all the questions. I was a straight man. And then I would go up and watch Saturday Night Live. So I was just two floors away from where I wanted to get to. Wow. But Wow. Yeah. And so weirdly, I did, as we all know. Um, but what's that process like? Is it you hunting down, trying to get an audition, or they saw you do something else. I was like, let's bring him in, see what... After one of the boys, I was enough, whatever, I got a manager in L.A. I auditioned for SNL a couple times. Uh, I One of my worst auditions was the Comedy Store, five minutes of pop, one after the other. I went on like 11 o'clock following Sam Kennison. In, oh, man. In his prime. Yeah. <laughs> with no MC in between. You Sam levitated the room, and now Dana Garney. They never got my name <laughs> right. No one ever said Dana Carvey once. Uh, epic bomb. Well, it's not special. It was just <laughs> fucking nightmare. So that put me in a deep depression for a couple months. Ugh. But then eventually I go back to the other cafe. I'm playing clubs. More clubs are opening. I'm playing Seattle. I'm starting to do seven, eight shows a week. Three, time, three, three weeks a month. 
So I and I'm so I'm really starting to get better, a lot better. But still in LA, it wasn't happening for me. Audition once. Uh, I think Al Franken saw me at the Punchline in San Francisco, mm. but I had a bad set. I had no confidence. Uh, in the meantime, because I had an agent and a manager, and I took everything, I was just insecure. I did a pilot with Desi Arnaz Jr. Uh, called Whacked Out, just a goofy pilot, and we're doing we're doing the pilot with the live audience, yeah, and we're fucking bombing. <laughs> and then I hear this gruff voice going. What's the matter with you people? This is funny. It's Lucille Ball at 80 years of age. Defending you. Defending her son. Admonishing the audience. Yeah. Well, Desi Arthur Jr., he was not in a good place. He got a B12 shot every morning. They pack him in ice, give him a cookie, put him out there. <laughs> that kind of thing. Incredibly nice guy. But she, she, then they go, my God, it's Lucille Ball. So the whole, the whole taping stopped. The whole audience got in a line and wanted to get her autograph. Took like two hours. We're in the back. Like, what the? <laughs> what is this? I did a pilot called um, City Slickers with Michael Richards. I played the innocent sheriff in a small town. He did his Michael Richards thing. Hey, kid, you, you know, whatever he does. I did a lot of pilots that sucked. And I, in retrospect, I shouldn't have done any of it. I should have had confidence in myself. I eventually did turn it all down. I did another crazy one, Blue Thunder, with James Farentino. And I played the guy in the helicopter with him, hmm. Clinton Wonderlove. And my lines again. Wait, Clinton Wonderlove? Wonderlove? What was your name? Wonderlove. Now, wow. James, who went that to That should be your Instagram handle, by the way, Clinton Wonderlove. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you don't want to be known, found. <laughs> so uh, the stories are so bizarre, even as I say them. I have to admit. James, I love this. this James is Farentino is in full Scarface mode, okay? I didn't know. So he's got... We go up in the fake helicopter, and they're waving us around, throwing fog at us. Most of my lines were just like, he goes, jam him, Jeffo. And I go, I am jamming. I am jamming. You know, I was in the helmet, and just, you know, it was horrible. He has a styrofoam <laughs> cup of what I thought was water. Huge, a little bit of ice in it. He leaves. There's a guy down there looks like he deals cocaine. <laughs> so I just go, I'll take a sip. I'm thirsty. I don't want to get out of this suit, get out of the helicopter. It's straight vodka. It's like 9 a.m., he would rip the pages out of the script and just slam them on the <laughs> instrument panel. And then he would kind of lean out because he's like, I'm better than this, you fucks. <laughs> you know, it's just like insane. He would call me at night at home. What are they saying about me? <laughs> what are they saying? So that went on. Bubba Smith almost beat him up. Bubba Smith. The football player. Football player. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Dick Buckus. They yeah. were our sidekick goofy, goofy guys. Bubba Smith was 6'8", 280. So Jan James Ferentino's not having a good day. What the fuck? Would I do that? And, you know, calm down, James. And then he kind of, I don't remember the exact language, but he somewhat sort of threatened Bubba a little bit. That's, and, that was not a smart yeah. move. So Bubba just stood there, kind of put his, uh, his hands out and said, go ahead, take any piece you want. <laughs> and wow. I think James, yeah. even though he's coked up, you know, yeah, <laughs> yeah, sure. I think I, you know, I think I uh, could see my shrink now because I'm, uh, you know, but, uh, so that ended, but the way it ended was weird. So in the meantime, I'm killing in clubs. I'm doing this goofy show. I wanted out of it. I told James, hey, get me out. And then and the wardrobe guy I was friends with, and I was kind of telling him, you know, I do stand-up and stuff. He goes, yeah, sure, okay, <laughs> right, yeah. No, I'm a comedian. It's okay, it's okay. So they got me all dressed up one day, 10th episode, put me on the thing, put me in the chopper, waving us around, stopped it. Uh, Dana, can you come down the ladder? So they, they take me down the ladder, and they fire me with the thing on in front of everybody. Come on. What? Yeah. Yeah, you're, 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 you're let go. So I have to walk in front, walk of shame. <laughs> Talk about the walk with of shame. With the helicopter outside. Well, I finally got the helmet yeah. off, I think. But I'm just walking back to the wardrobe guy, and then I'm a little emotional, even though I was pretty fucking happy. But it was 30000 a month again. You know. What, I didn't know that. In, like, 82? 83? This is like 83, 80, that's 83. I mean, yeah. So then I say to the wardrobe. I mean, you're guy, making good money on terrible things, but like you're right, supporting but it, it, yourself. But it didn't, it was torture. It was yeah. stupid. And yeah. I got smart in a second. But basically, that was the last straw. So I said to the my wardrobe friend, you know, I was kind of emotional because that was the way they did it. It was so fucked up. Yeah. Yeah. And, that's and, the worst. And he was really put his arm around. It's okay, man. It's okay. 
So then I did run into him later after my five, six years of SNL. I'm the star of SNL, Wayne's World kicking. I'm at some thing, something I'm doing, and he's there. And he's like, Dana, you were right. You were right, man. He was so stunned. You, you are yeah, funny. You are the funny. guy with the helmet that yeah. got fired. <laughs> so he went crazy. Did he ever tell you why they had to do, why they chose to do it that way instead of just, hey, come no. in early. You don't need to dress don't, up today. Don't know why. Who were you replaced by? They put in a very attractive blonde woman. Oh. Okay. But I was terrible, and it was terrible. But then I, I'm still doing the clubs. The agents are still pushing me to do stuff. I, I got real close to Amadeus. You know, I, I, I had a screen test with mm-hmm. that. Thank God. Steven I Spielberg, get. Amadeus, yes. Um, Milos Foreman. Oh, did. yeah. It was about Mozart, who had a boyish... Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. I was yeah. thinking of Amistad. My bad. Amadeus, no, no, yeah. yes. Yes. And then they, they offer me Funst, Fenster Hall, a spinoff of Punky Brewster. 30000 for the pilot. I'm going to do do that. With Soleil Moonfry as Punky Brewster, and you're like the <laughs> dean of students or something? No, like, I don't. I, I think it was oh. pre that. It was like 84. Oh, got it. So then I finally had said enough of, you know, Lucio Ball yelling of one of the boys, enough. I'm not doing it. And then I really just said, I'm just going to do stand-up for two years. So then I really focused on stand-up. So I'm just stand-up. And so Robin would come in, levitate the room, and I would just think, I got to get better. You know, I got to get better. Wow. And I was very competitive. I always was as a kid. So I wanted to headline um, everywhere I went. I wanted to kill so hard that they would not remember the first two acts, even if they were my friends. <laughs> you know, I just was. I so mean, listen, you could support your friends, but also want that for Oh, no, yourself. I always yeah. played fair. I yeah. never sabotaged. I supported them. I mean, I had, there were gunslingers too. Al LaBelle was a really great, is a great stand-up. And he had this song he would do at the end with a tape. I'm Al Lupel, and he really could sing. So I'm playing a comedy club with him where the dressing room, the wall is common with the club. So I'm sitting on the couch. He's killing so hard. I'm just here. The whole room is vibrating, you know, from his yeah, yeah. act. And now, and then the door opens, he comes in. He's like, yeah, it's great eyes, man. And the crowd, more, more, more. And then and now Dan O'Flarfo, you know, never done. <laughs> so it was war. It was but fucking. But you sound like you are no longer the, the shy or the introvert or the part of you that's like, you've gotten past that by oh, now. Uh, I'm much, much, much better. And then, so then I was getting really good. And I was getting fans. And I was a uh, headliner in all the clubs. I never was a road monster. I played the Rib Tickler in Minnesota. I played um, Spellbinders in Houston with this famous comedian opened for me who died. Oh, he's such a Kennison type brilliant guy. Anyway, um, so I was doing that, and then it comes around that um, some people who had worked with SNL saw me at the Comedy Magic Club in Hermosa Beach. So then it's, they say, okay, Lorne Michaels is going to come see you. Okay, so Lorne had never seen me. So I'm like, they it, said. In L.A.? In L.A. Okay. Because I kept a little place down there. Even though we, we were going back and forth. We had a place in San Francisco. It was like, am I going to make it? Maybe we'll just live up there. So I had a little place, and I said, I'm not going to audition at the Improv or the Comedy Store. I'd been there, done that. There's a little club on the west side doesn't exist anymore in Santa Monica. It was called Igby's. It's 100 seats, low ceiling, great crowd, not an industry crowd. I played there a lot and killed in the room. So you were setting yourself up for for success. success. Well, the only roadblock, which was not, was Rosie O'Donnell was headlining that week. So I had to convince the owner to talk to Rosie about what was going to happen and accommodate me. And Rosie said yes. It's amazing. So I, so first of all, I'm leaving to go there. This is the culmination of everything I've been telling you, and I knew it. So I'm really nervous, and uh, my wife and I, we go to a gas station. It's just like early evening. They go, oh, we have no gas here. There is no gasoline here. And I go, what? <laughs> you know? At a gas station. <laughs> yeah. So I'm getting so nervous, and I go there, and I'm just, just trying to control. Now I'm confident, but I'm terrified. I'm fighting all of it, you know. And I meet Rosie O'Donnell, 
And she seemed supernaturally confident, like crazy. Like, I go, where have I, how have I not met you before? All right. So it was like, I'll go on first. But it was the middle act what did less or whatever. I was going to get 40 minutes, 35 to 40 instead of five. And I was, at this point, I was doing 75 minute sets. And I was pretty loaded, you know. So then I go over. And I'm um, off the side of the stage, and there's people around. And I'm looking for, I go up, and I see, uh, I see the head of the network come in, Brandon Tartikoff at the time. Of NBC. NBC. Mm -hmm. Head of NBC comes in. Then I see Lorne Michaels come in. I see where they're, being, they're, they're getting seated. You know, come on. Then Cher comes in. Oh, come on. Yes. So your heart rate is at what right now? Oh, uh, I don't know. It's is, all is, just deep she, she just happened to be there to see comedy? She was hanging out with oh. them, maybe talking about something. I ran into her over the years, and she's like, I tell people I was there the night you made it. You know? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so that, so then I, I do my set. I would say it's a, it's a C plus, but I was in such good shape that if you ask Lauren, he was already thinking about how I'd be on the show. Even though I didn't have the look, I still had kind of the, Page boy, blondish hair. I, I always felt SNL guys like Bill Murray would make you laugh or beat you up. Right. I mean, Dan Aykroyd, Chevy, they were just giant pirates, Belushi. They were like, they'd fucking fight you, they'd drink, they'd drugs, and fight you. And then it was just me. I'd give me a Bud Light, and I looked like I was 12. Nope. We, you know, so then um, I met Lauren outside. I wasn't sure. What was I, your act then, though? Uh, I had a church lady. Okay. I had a chop and broccoli. There was a little piano there. Those two made it on the first show. I did Jimmy Stewart. Mm -hmm. You know, I did other voices, other characters. Did you do Paul McCartney knowing that he was probably friends with Paul McCartney? I didn't know <laughs> he, who his friends or anything uh, like that. I'm not sure I had a Paul bit. <laughs> you know, that comes up in a second. Got it. Uh, I'm so ahead of the game. Now, when you are, <laughs> but that's a good question. My yeah. research skills. I, I, I'd have to think about what I really did in Totem, but I know right, those right. were on there. Yeah. The, the, the major characters and impersonations that you do, obviously there's people like a president, but mm -hmm. what about church lady? What, what about, did you draw on something from real life or do you just riff one day I, and you come up with something? That came up over time at that small club, the other cafe. It started out that when I would come on the stage, the audience, I look so young uh, that the audience, I sort of pretend what they're thinking. What? And I started doing that attitude, this rhythmic, condescending attitude. I don't know where it came from. It's like, well, apparently they l let minors come into this place. <laughs> it wasn't the church lady. It was just people thinking that. Then I would do it as any condescending teacher you ever had in right. school. Let's fold our paper in half, make a little <laughs> sailboat. Well, it looks like mine's a little bit better than yours. <laughs> so then I enfolded it into being a Lutheran, into the church lady people, the woman behind the punch bowl, the orthopedic shoes, completely asexual, the real power of the church. And then that became that, and it started to get into, I remember just, I didn't write things down. I was just on stage. They said, well, isn't that special? Just came <laughs> out one night. As the ultimate dismissal of a human being. Yeah, yeah we're trying to do a podcast. We're doing this. Yeah. Oh, oh that is not special. We have we had that somewhere, don't we? It's going in the trailer now. Do we? <laughs> <laughs> well, don't, yeah, we ha don't we have one of those? We have it in real life. I don't know we why do have we it in real need life. it here. I mean, here it comes well, for you. Well, isn't that special? <laughs> Good. So, so then, uh, Good. So Good. then I thought I, I, I was told I was in the running. I met Phil Hartman and John Lovitz at our mutual manager's office. You know, hello. <laughs> Hi. We liked you immediately. L Phil was so shy. They said maybe he'll be a writer. But he was already the star of, he was doing sketch at the Groundlings. He was, inf you know, famous at the Groundlings. So then we had to do one more audition at like a studio. Okay, I'll do it. And you just go out cold. And Lauren is there with like cast members, Lovitz, Nora Dunn, a few other people. It's just dry. Dry, it's like nothing. the coldest room. Cold. Yeah. And then I'm doing my stuff. I can't remember what I was doing. And then there was a fire alarm in the middle of my audition. You know, and then finally they solved it. So that was 10 minutes of death. I'm just standing there. And then Lauren goes, is there anything else that we need to see? Or is that about it? You know. Isn't I, that special? I realized later he was testing me. Because the pressure of SNL was so intense. 
if somebody gets emotional, or I, I'm sorry, you can't. You have I can't, to can't. Yeah. You can't ever let the skin. flag touch the ground. Jim Carrey comes on after me, puts his foot behind his thing, does every voice you could think of, <laughs> hops on one foot, turns his shirt inside. I mean, it's just like, well, he's got it, you know. Um, but the way Lauren cast it at that time, and Jim did fine <laughs> in Living Color, he looked at it like a sitcom almost in yeah. parts and pieces. We can't have everyone doing that one note. Yeah. You so, have something different than he brings. Yeah, but he was amazing. I didn't think I was going to get it. And then I, I realized I got it. And this is July of 86. And I would just, I'd played little bomber clubs. I played a pizza parlor in Martinez. It was just one of those one-nighters in that, er, a couple weeks earlier, only four people showed up. Half the audience hated me. Good night. Um, <laughs> now, when you get on SNL in July, so it, when they do the premiere, what, September probably? It's usually? October 11th. Okay. And I'm scared. Now I'm really scared. I'm going to fuck up on Saturday Night Live. They said the show was canceled, but they brought it back for only an eight-show pickup, the only time in the show's history. They said, if you don't hit the ground running, we're out. So I think I'm going to pull the plug on fucking SNL. Well, Lauren says, we'll come to Long Island and stay for a while. <laughs> I didn't even know what it meant. I guess I have to go. So I went, but my wife stayed in L.A. because she had a really good job. Writing speeches and for this, which I was mentioning on Instagram yeah. a little bit yesterday, and so I'm at Lauren Michaels' house for like two or three weeks. And I'm in, I'm in. You, know, you can take Jack's room. Jack who? Jack Nicholson. Oh. <laughs> and then it was that was where I met Paul. It was just pa Paul's coming over here tonight. Paul, pa Paul, Paul. Paul uh, that'd be Paul McCartney, <laughs> Linda. <laughs> so I'd never been on TV. Scared in my mind. Played a pizza parlor a few weeks before. <laughs> did the freaky thing with Rosie. Got in the show. Now I'm up there. Chevy Chase is dropping by saying he loved my audition tape. I go, really? <laughs> Whitney Brown is there. He was on SNL for a while. And Lauren. And then Linda and Paul came over four nights in a row from 10 o'clock to like 3 a.m. Just, just a hangout. Hanging out, playing music. Um, and I, that's where I got to know Paul in a very interesting way. I was really scared to say something stupid to him. But I was nobody. And so I just mentioned a song called Tug of War to him, and which my friends and I really love. We're Beatle fanatics, and we had every, every one of his albums, so it has gems on every one, and brought up that lyric, the chorus, one day we'll stand up on top of the world with our flag unfurled, but it won't be soon enough for me. I asked him, what, would, what were you thinking when you wrote that lyric? So then we're just friends after that. Oh, you know, I was thinking of a big flag, uh, you know, up on the mountain, you know, <laughs> didn't know. So he really trusts me after that. But I feel like that smart move by Lauren in that is you all are now hanging out, forming that chemistry, mm -hmm. getting to know each other. Pro I'm yeah. assuming that helps when you're under the lights and the cameras are on with some pressure. Oh, God, yes. And then, you know, you have to go to New York, have to get the apartment, have to go uh, into 8-H, seeing it. This is like because you're in there for like three weeks before the show starts. Uh -huh. What I'm going to do? What am I going to do? And a friend of mine gave me really good – piece of advice and uh i pass it on to chris chris red who's there because mm -hmm. um, i got to know him just a little bit texting and playing a few clubs in la mm -hmm. so he gets snl and i said i'm passing this word on to you from a friend of mine from 30 years ago because your emotion is to hide like curl up and i said this is the time to be audacious just be mm -hmm. audacious just balls out just fucking manhandle it go the opposite of your emotion and he's done really well on that show. So that's kind of cool. So when you get on SNL, you're a featured performer? I'm actually, I'd never done sketch comedy per se, except the Tumbling Nights. And I'm a full-time cast member. Which, which includes writing. No? But uncredited. Ah. But you don't get a credit, but you write. So Lauren's ex-wife and I, she's assigned to help me develop the church lady. So she's actually the one who came up with the, uh, we came up with a talk show. She came up with, how about church chat? Perfect. And the theme song, this woman named Cheryl was this music producer. We need a theme for church lady. She played the chords to Black Magic Woman backwards. So that was that thing. So I'm a full cast member, and I'm in the first sketch of the night with <laughs> Bill Hartman and Jan Hook. So all of us, it's our first time. Now they have 20 cast members have to be there for years. I didn't even know it was what the cold opening was. We were just the first sketch. And we, I, I play a game show psychic. I didn't write this one, but I'm a guy who answers questions before they're asked. Phil was great. Jan Hooks, all-time great. 
And finally, a fake meteor hits me. because, And the question is, and I go, meteor. And I was using Garth as that character because it was my brother Brad. I go, meteor, meteor. If you see it, I'm doing yeah. Garth. <laughs> I used it later with Mike. So that was my first night. And church chat was the practice show. It was the last sketch. It barely got on the show. Here's another weird one, almost like Cher. So my first week of SNL, the show's Saturday. Lauren says, uh, um, Neil Young is doing a show at Madison Square Garden. It's like a garage band motif. Needs kind of a lady, an old lady that would come in and yell at him. So on Wednesday, we do the read-through, and I did church lady in the read-through. Did okay, but it's so weird. You're not Eddie Bulbas and what the fuck, you know. Later on, I found out that it was on the bubble. It wasn't going to be on the show. But Phil Hartman kind of said, I think, let's give Church Lady a try. And I give Lauren credit to put it on. Meanwhile, while they're doing this, I'm going down to Madison Square Garden and meeting Neil. And then going out, they mic'd me up. I don't know if I had the same dress or some dress. And I go out, now you be quiet here. This is much too loud. Isn't that weird? And, so that, and then that premiered on SNL the same week? The same week. That was Wednesday <coughs> night. So I get back and I find out that I'm in the cold opening. I didn't know it was cold. I'm in that sketch. I'm in a sketch because Gorney Weaver was the host. I'm in sort of an alien sketch playing the guy who's like, we're going to die, man, <laughs> which is a good part, <laughs> right? Um, I do chop and broccoli with Phil and Sigourney Weaver on the show. So I do the dress show, practice show. The church lady is the good night, the last show before the good nights on the practice show, where the, the graveyard, right? Yeah, yeah. I get out there. I'm in the dress. I had uh, all those hours on stage, 10,000 hours in clubs, knowing where the, the hot spot is. I said, well, isn't that special to Victoria Jackson playing my sidekick? Boom, laugh. Big laugh. It took all of my, my stand-up person, really wanted to face the audience. Because I'd never really done sketch. So I go, oh, no, I got to talk to her. <laughs> I go, stage, folks. Don't break the fourth wall. So it basically <laughs> kills, moves up to the first sketch position. The cold opening did well. Chomp Broccoli did fine. So suddenly, I am the show. The show's in the dumper. It's the first show of the season. I have four showcasing things. I can't remember the third one. And they're guaranteed eight? They're eight. guaranteed eight. Eight. But, but I was just four, three months, <laughs> 10 weeks before I was playing the pizza parlor. Yeah. Then I just for SNL. Then I met Paul McCartney. Then I developed this thing. Yeah. Then I went to Madison Square Garden. Now the live show is coming at 1130. And I'm so nervous. I'm in my dressing room. I'm kind of swearing at, at myself with the mirror. Fuck, fuck, fuck you. And my manager comes in at the time, Brad Gray, who passed That's, away. Yeah. But Brad, oh, he's very low key. Talk like this. So he sat down, and he goes, uh, I don't know why. I don't know why it happened, but uh, it's your show, you know. It's your show tonight, you know. I don't know how this is going. He, he, was, he was Joe Biden's cousin. <laughs> 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 I don't know. <laughs> Number one. You got so, so I go out, and um, my instincts kicked in. The crowd was hot, and church lady just, whoosh, and it's the kind of sh thing that, Lauren Michaels loves because Phil would come in. Then all these religious scandals started to happen. Mm. Phil and Jam would come in and score or love it or Sean Penn. I'm doing a thing where I'm making fun of his wife. She's standing right off camera <laughs> glaring at me. Well, Madonna, she's got the name but doesn't quite live up to the Lord. Then he, <laughs> he, he sucker punches me. We fight. I do. Uh, John Goodman. So Church Lady is just explodes. And then I had all this other stuff, too. Chopped broccoli killed. I only did it once on SNL, but it did, just people never forgot it. Right. So then um, then I'm back in the dress, small dressing room, and then I'm just, I just break down. <laughs> I just sob. Um, is because, this? Because you're like, this is it. It doesn't get better well, than this, this? I'm thinking of me as a kid yeah. dreaming this. I'm thinking of just... The, all the path I went, the, the stupid uh, sitcom and, and, and all the the bombs and the things that were canceled and being shit on. And For, then what is that now? 17, 18 years you've been working since the first? Well, no, my first set was 76. And then so it, it's this a full is 10, 10 years. years. Yeah, the that's classic right. 10, 10 years. years. So now I'm on Saturday Night Live. I, I really scored hard in the first show. Um, everything came crashing down on me. Like this was my 
ultimate dream, like came true live in real time. And Sigourney Weaver afterward, you're going to have a career. Paul Simon's coming over. You know, I'm slightly emotional talking about it now because yeah. it was um, just so surreal. But you can see the Mickey Rooney part of it and uh, um, just Cher being there and yeah. James Ferentino and just all this weird stuff. Slivered in there right before I got SNL was one last thing I did that wasn't stand up because it was a feature film with Burt Lancaster and Kirk Douglas, and that's called Tough Guys. Tough so guys. I brought that yeah. up to you a couple weeks yes. ago, and I was like, I saw like an AFI tribute thing yeah. that you did for Kirk Douglas, mm -hmm. and I, like, I didn't realize that you did like dramatic movies. Well, well I didn't. Oh, like, I, I, I didn't. I, I just luckily, weirdly, got that part uh, because, and I was in awe of them. That was another surreal. Yeah. So uh, one question from that. So that's how I made it, guys. Isn't dude, that how you close it? So e yeah, no, that's yeah. so easy. I, we're going to try to do the same exact thing. Um, <laughs> one la uh, a question on that, though. You're standing there. You clearly have made it. It's hitting, all, it's hitting you at once. So you've achieved that dream you want. How does yeah. that sit with you? Like, do you need a new one? Is, are you going to expand and make, make that dream bigger now? Oh, yeah. Well, we had a show next week. Oh, well, yeah, and awesome. it was just one time. The next week, I wasn't in the show very much. And I remember Lauren seeing me like kind of tricked out. He's like, it happens. You go up, you go down. You go up. But um, then the dream just expanded. I was getting more confident. Yeah. The show was gelling. I mean, we first started there. We come out of the elevators on the Friday night, 11 a.m. There'd be like two autograph people there. But by 91 or 92, we had Sandler and Mike came in. And, and um, we had, of course, Phil emerged, Jan and, you know, um, Chris Rock came. We just, then we'd come out and it'd be like the Beatles. We were like, the whole show had lifted. And for a while, when Church Chat was on, the rating pop was, they'd never seen something like that. You know, the, because it was just this thing. It was a yeah. thing for a while. Oh, you got to see it, what Church Lady is going to do. And so, and I was just riding that wave. And then, you know, I, one time I went to do stand up in New London, Connecticut. I drove myself a theater. Only time I had it tonight, the church lady, you know? Oh, so I was a little bit, I didn't want to be a one trick pony. Right. You know, right. other things came in Hans and Franz and Wayne's world. And then the political impressions came in as well. And that all worked to a second culmination when I was doing Ross Perot, the president won the Emmy it's only a couple people have because it's a weird category. Mm -hmm. Got on the cover of Rolling Stone. Wayne's World was a global hit. And so that was – the. but that first night is what was so memorable because it just unleashed so much emotion and frustration because in retrospect, I, I was pretty close. I was going to maybe not make it. I was maybe just not going to get the brass ring, especially SNL. I thought if I hadn't made it then – Maybe I wouldn't have been in a position. I was lucky that Rosie was there. I was lucky that club was available. There was like a lot of things that fell my way. Right on. And then in the show, a lot of things fell my way. Mike Myers asked me to be part of Wayne's World. Oh, I was assigned George Bush Sr. before he was president. He wins the presidency. So now it's four years of material. And Lovitz called me to concede before the actual Dukakis called the actual president. <laughs> you won. Congratulations. You'll be in the cold opening for four oh. years. So we both knew what that meant. So it was such overwhelming good fortune and good luck and just having just a lot of fun doing it now. But yeah. also a lot of hard work and yeah. failure and you yes. you getting better. Like, I mean, it's both. You got to get lucky, but you got to work hard. Work your ass off. Yeah. Uh, just do those clubs. Put in these hours uh, and go through all that pain. It's just gritty. SNL's gritty. I mean, it's, it's smelly, and there's tape, and you're, you've got a co they're ripping things off you. Comedy Club, the Friday Night Late Show, when they're packed and drunk, and you're following this great middle act, you're just like grit and suffering. It really is a lot of failure, mostly failure. Impressions like the George Sr., the president, um, did you have an impression, or did you just no. have to create that at SNL? I was terrible. No, I'd never done it before, and I'd never even thought to do it. I was like, hi, I'm George Bush. I had nothing. I had nothing. But then when he won the presidency, it took me a long time. And I was trying to find a hook. I was just watching him. That's how I do it. I don't have any method except watching him. And one night I was with Al Franken, and we're sitting around. It's a bad impression, and I just came up with that, that guy over there doing that thing, that thing he does out in that whole area. It probably wasn't that well-formed. But Al really started laughing, and that was the hook in. 
Using your hand. using your hand? Yeah, thinking that guy oh. in that area out there doing that thing he does over there, that thing he does. And then, like, what I like to do is wind down on things. So they become a character. And so over the four years, it became, you know, he may be not going to do it, became not got that. And uh, the audience took the journey with me. Right. And because it was in one, uh, there were no cutaways. It was the only time I could really take liberties with improvising a little bit right. and especially <clears throat> visually because when the when when the audience knows you're being you're discovering it they sense it subconsciously mm -hmm. and when it's not a joke they can laugh really fucking hard it's kind of like when church lady was doing something physical or fighting with saddam hussein with john goodman <laughs> then the audience just laughs to a point of just when i did one church lady with um, Walter Payton and Joe Montana playing football. Let's get our pig skin under here and go out and thrust. And <laughs> it killed so hard that the sound man, the old sound mic, got sound <laughs> stopped me afterwards. He goes, kid, I've been here a long time. I've been here through the height of SNL and everything. I never seen the meters peak like that. Wow. So that was... But you know, that was nice. That is, isn't that the? I mean, a kernel of that method you did all the way back twenty years ago with yes. the Beatles. With, with your brothers, though. You you yeah. were practicing it then. You yes. just got really good at it. Yes, I had a knack that I developed. But it, when I got to SNL, my wife even said that. How many impressions did I really do? But then they would assign me. Right. And then you would discipline yourself. Mm. That's why I try to make it a task. Like, okay, I'm going to do Fauci and I'm going to do Biden. I'm still evolving Biden. I just have the beginnings of the hook. But uh, that, yeah, was my, that was my favorite when I wished you a Merry Christmas and you sent me back a Dr. Fauci <laughs> wishing me a Merry Christmas. I know. Yeah. I've just made him a character <laughs> like I did George Bush Sr. I'm Dr. Tony Fauci. You know, I don't mind pandemics, you know. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, people pay attention to what I'm saying. I mean, you know, eight months ago, I had a bow tie on, you know, a cup of coffee. I'm in a room. They knock every two hours. I go, whatever, you know. Now, all of a sudden, I'm on CNN every night. I'm getting ladies uh, writing me letters. You know, my wife and I are getting frisky. I mean, she was, uh, you know, making love every other month to a 79-year-old doctor <laughs> named Anthony Fauci. Now she's fucking a star. And from the bottom of my Fauci, go fuck yourself. <laughs> so that, that is just a fun song that I love doing. And I'm just enjoying it, enjoying it so much. Um. So segue into a little something different because you've been super supportive of me. We've had a million conversations about like, yeah, stick with it, kid. Like you just never because know. Because I was a waiter. Yeah. And I remember what waitering taught me is, is that uh, always assume that the waiter is smarter than you. I mean, people would treat me so bad at the Holiday Inn. It was like they would play jokes on me. Hey, we need something. Then I come over. No, we don't. <laughs> You know, that kind of stuff. So, But you would always tell me, like, listen, I, you've been on both sides of the camera because you had your own show after SNL. Oh, yeah. That, then I had this that, whole that other wasn't, story. That wasn't successful. And then you basically... Artistically, it was, but it didn't belong right. after Spin City. Yeah. <laughs> or was it a... What was the Tim Allen show? Home Improvement. Home Improvement. Home Improvement. Yeah, yeah. That's a whole other story. But well, wasn't yeah. Steve Carell <laughs> we'll and, that Steve, part. and Stephen Colbert, weren't they like, that was like their first gigs? Was on oh, your yeah. show? Yeah. And they were nervous and scared, and at SNL had passed them up. They're yeah. in their early 30s. They don't know what's going to happen for them. They were so thrilled to get it. And they were just, uh, you know, they were so good that the first day of rehearsal, I hadn't done sketch in a while. I go, I got to really get back in shape. <laughs> you know? Right. And right. they were hungry. <clears throat> yeah. And brilliant. So. What was that audition process like? Because I remember you told me, I don't know which guy it was, but you said someone came in and it was like they didn't really have a good audition. But well, you knew. you knew. I, had, I was a horrible auditioner. And I would bomb for everything practically. I mean, I, one time I bomb, I probably lost, I auditioned for 100 things when they're sending me out in 81, 82, and I was too stupid. And I would just not get them. And so much rejection. One time they said, not only they don't like you, they, uh, you frighten them. <laughs> well, I don't think <laughs> that's good feedback. But, you, but yeah. was Steven, uh, Steven was pretty confident. They came in a room, me, Louis C.K., and Robert Smigel. Steve Carell came in a little nervous. He wasn't really on point, really funny. I saw his tape. We brought him back. Then we were in L.A., and he uh, then he just popped. You yeah. Know. But but I knew. I said, well, that's not him. He's just, he's just you know, intimidated, nervous, in a little room. And um, 
that's another very strange part of uh, what's happened to me on the planet. Another that Carell and Colbert on that show became what they became right. from that show. And it's sort of funny. I'll run into them once in a while. I'm running into Nancy and Steve, and I go, "You would have made it anyway. Don't you know? Don't think that." And then Nancy goes, "No, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> he really needed that <laughs> because they all used that to kind of grandfather into the Daily Show. I see. And then they went from there. Right. But then they'd been on television. They had a ta- They did a sketch called Nauseating Wait- Nauseated Waiters. Was so funny, and they used that. Um, so. I just did a Zoom with Colbert, Stephen. Yeah. And we're, he, we just have a relationship. Like, if I don't talk to him for 10 years, I talk to him just because he used to stay at my house in Malibu. We wrote a script together. And I do think that uh, to treating people the same all the time, uh, you know, I don't really do it in, or even say I'm doing it in a self congratulatory way. It just seems like because people would shit on me, it just seems like a natural thing. I told them I'm just where you were at just three minutes ago. Right. I don't know how brilliant you are. And it, when the show got canceled, I said to them the way I remember it, you know, I said, you guys have all the ingredients you need to make it from here. You're not only really funny and really versatile, you're also very likable. I don't know if you're going to make it. <laughs> right. But I can tell you this. You have everything you need. And then they, there they went, you know. So yeah, well, I mean, it sounds like you had, I mean, you had spent that 10 years developing everything you need. You just needed the shot. You know, you have to I was so talent insecure. and opportunity you have to meet. Yeah, I was so insecure. And confidence is a, a mercurial kind of. <laughs> it's hard to I, grasp. Yeah, and I always say that, <clears throat> or the way I try to express it is that, say you're, you're confident you're going to call it, you're at 40%. You know, you're not feeling that good. And then you get, you work your way up, maybe as a stand-up or whatever. You work your way up, and you feel like, wow, I'm, I'm, like a, I'm like a 96 right now, you know. But then if you can go to 100, that last 4% is bigger than the previous 96. 96 yeah. There's something about this having no fear, getting out of your own way. It's kind of like, you know, wait till they get a load of me. Right. I'm not worried about the audience <laughs> at all. And, you know, when I do stand-up now, I, they, I just kid them about it. I go, you know, I just say, I mean, pre-pandemic, I go, well, you know I'm a, I'm a millionaire. I mean, I'm really rich. And if I levitate the room or bomb, this has no effect on me at all. Because my <laughs> wife said, I'm playing these shithole clubs with my son. My wife says, you got to tell the audience why you're there. Because they, they don't know. I'm, I was doing corporate dates for a long time. Uh, now I'm sort of back. But they don't know. And they think maybe I need the $13. <laughs> so she goes, you got to tell them. But I like the idea of it. Uh, but confidence is the thing. And, you know, there's you collect victories as a stand-up. And I think when you get a few hundred of them, mm-hmm. suddenly the pressure's mm-hmm. on the audience. You wow. know, rather than needy, like me, am I funny? Can I do this? And I call it the second voice, giving yourself a report card. Huh. And that second voice, you could have it when you're having sex or anything you're doing where you're judging <laughs> yourself or questioning, or thinking, and all you want to do in art or podcasting is shut up that voice and just be present in the moment, and normally that comes from just doing it. There's no other way. Do it, do it, do it. Well, I mean, I appreciate especially you and Spade when I talk to you. I mean, you guys have the same demeanor with me. You tell me the same things. I mean, I've had probably 10 years of pilot seasons that I did not get, and then you're Mm -hmm. just like, it has nothing to do probably with your ability. Like, they could probably just you the dark haired guy and they want the blonde haired kid like uh, you, you know so i appreciate all the feedback you've always given me and all the compliments cuz that well, helps my extra 4% cuz yeah, like, i mean conversations i have with angelo it's like Car- oh yeah carby said i might make it one day like <laughs> well, that goes that goes more for me than i've auditioned people too and so when they come in you're really you're just viscerally uh, experiencing just the, their type if it's a if it's a movie right Oh, uh, your vibe, how do you talk, whatever. And most of the time, when people would come in, some would be nervous, some would be not, they'd be really, as far as just performance, and a narrow, narrow, like they're all really good. And I, after a while, would go stop them outside because <laughs> I, I could see they felt bad. i go, you're just as good as anyone who's just come in. We're going to make all these other decisions based on other things, just so you know that. And they're like, really? It's like when I did this long story goofy kids movie called 
Master of Disguise. So Harold Gould. Pistachio Disguise. A crazy movie that never <laughs> should have. Pistachio Disguise. That's a whole other podcast. <laughs> what, you know. We would love we to have you back. gladly have yes. you on for. That's, that's as big or a fantastical a story as anything I've told you. Uh, but what was kind of nice is Harold Gould was just, at that point, you know, a famous older actor. And he got it right away, what I wanted him to do. And so I just called him that night after his first day at home. And he goes, nobody calls. Nobody ever calls. No. I just, you guys said, why wouldn't I call you? And say, you're doing spot on what I want you to do. We're doing this vaudevillian rhythm. Hey, well, you know, you, you, stop, you, keep, you, you always hit a man with an open, open hand. Let him keep his dignity. A slap at a dummy. You know, all that stuff. And I was like, well, that was this frequency here. It was a musical. And he was great. So if someone comes up to me, because I do this throwaway, silly character, Red Red Necky, the redneck comedian. It's like the worst comedian in the world. He's a southern comic, you know. I'm Red Red Necky, the redneck comedian. I knew, I knew a guy. I knew a redneck who married his sister, but only because mama turned him down. Come and get some. And that's his catchphrase. So I want people to repeat that or my, my Obama. Michelle, because Obama's always invading my podcast. Dana, am I on this week? <laughs> no, I'm having my sister act. What? Instead of the former leader of the free world, you're going to have a housewife from Connecticut. Michelle, I'm not on. <laughs> nope, not on this week. Leave the egg salad out. Just leave it out. Just you Don't do anything. I'll make a sandwich. Dana, I love her very much, but we're just in each other's face. So, Michelle, I'm not on this week. And then one time I had Bob come on. He goes, I'm coming on. And I go, um, well, we don't really, we already have a guest. No, no, Dana, I'm coming on. And I got to pitch you some ideas. We got a huge deal, huge deal over there. Netflix never produced anything. I, you know, I got an idea for a movie about a big ship that sinks, and um, I'm calling it Gigantic. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's Titanic. Oh fuck me, Michelle. What do you got? Nope, they didn't like Gigantic. Nope, didn't go. So that that's become uh, oh, my new God. toy. I don't know why <laughs> Obama now has become just. And again, it's. For me, it's just funny. It's, it's apolitical. Having his voice invade the podcast, it's just something about that, you know, talking like that. So uh, that's all I still aspire to because that's what got me as a kid with my siblings. Just you like to make people laugh. You like to Monty Python, them. repeating stuff. Right. People making us. Uh, Andy Kaufman was just, you know, God, insanely God. funny. Um, a weird thing happened. Like, I wasn't really friends with Andy Kaufman, but. I just thought he was so interesting and so bizarre. And then his partner wrote a book and wanted to interview me, you know. And um, this was the guy who played Tony Clifton for you comedy fans. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Bob Jim somebody Kennedy is his sidekick who, who also put the Tony Clifton makeup on, you know, so you didn't know if it was Andy or him. So he called me, and it was really interesting or flattering and weird. I, uh, he just would tell me about Andy, and I talked and talked, and I said, well, I said – all roads lead to Andy. And then I got the book, and that's there's a whole page, right? The first page of the book just says, all roads lead to Andy. <laughs> it's yeah. weird, okay? I didn't even know him that well. But I like the foreign man. I like the rhythm. Thank you yeah. very much. Yeah. yeah, I like that. I like Steve Martin. I like a blue spot. You know, I like that his didn't have jokes. It was just these rhythmic things. And um, Richard Pryor... Uh, you know, he was a good actor on Ed Sullivan. He would act, he'd do a lot of act outs and stuff and rhythms and characters. I had a sweet moment with him. I did a movie called Moving. First year of SNL, I'm just doing a guest spot on his movie. Did the movie, and the director came up to me and said, Richard's just phoning it in today. He's not, he's not doing it. And I was playing a schizophrenic who drives his car across country. So I said, okay. He goes, can you get Richard going? <laughs> what? <laughs> Get Richard going. I'll try. So I was doing all my shtick and doing all this stuff. And then he started to come alive. And he was really, really doing it. Such a sweet, shy, sensitive guy. Very reminds me of Robin, you know. And I went into the wrong trailer at one point. And he was sitting in the dark. It was after he set himself on fire. And he had all his makeup. And he had all the, you know, tissue paper. And he's just sitting by himself, quiet. And he's like, how you doing, young man? You know, just that kind of low energy. Are you having fun? You having fun? That's what the old timers always told me. I ran into Rodney Dangerfield once. Hey, you having fun? You know, because at the end of the day, the, the life's short. So you having yeah, fun? Yeah. And Rod, Rodney also didn't make it until he was like 50 or something. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
Now, do you find a lot of them because they have to be so on on stage are very quiet and kind of saving energy think, yes. when no one's yes. on them? I would say that's predominantly true with Steve Martin and obviously uh, Richard, Robin, mm. you know. Um, I Mike Myers said something interesting. We were just casually talking the other day. He said he, he was, ran into Bruce Springsteen at a party, and he said he was talking so softly that he had to say, I, Bruce, I, I can't hear a word you're saying. <laughs> we got to find a place in the middle. <laughs> America's a great land. And we know we can find this place. It's over a hill, but down a creek bed in the back of a barn. I'll get directions for you in the middle. I'm Bruce. Excuse me? Because look at him on stage. Yeah, right. So he's got to be. He's got to be at a thousand, so he wants I'm to. I'm going to go pack myself an ice in the barn for a half hour, get a B12 shot, and meditate. <laughs> Later on, I'll scream for seven hours. To <laughs> yeah, it's true. Here's something we didn't talk about. So when you were at the height of SNL's fame, were there any film offers that came your way that you turned down that became like Ace, no, Vin did I, Ace Ventura come to you first and you're like, nah, I'm good? Yes. It did? Yes. Seriously? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I just threw that out there. I didn't know, I didn't know yeah. that either. Yeah. But but Jim just did something you're not supposed to do and it worked so beautifully. He just he just threw out every rule. I watched it with Nicolas Cage, who was really good friends with. Uh, I was doing a movie with him, another shitbox movie I got trapped into, Trapped in Paradise. With Nicolas Cage, who was great and hilarious. And so we watched Ace Ventura, a little theater in, in the middle of Canada. And so we got it right. All oh, righty. Then all that stuff where he's not even mm. in the scene. He's just, just doing it. Just abstract. But uh, I turned down that. I did Opportunity Knox, which was a mistake. But that was Ron Howard's company. And Ron Howard is like the Dalai Lama of show yeah. business. Yeah. <laughs> he's the sweetest person on earth. Yeah, I've heard nothing but good things about him from. All also, heard a rumor watching. that the original Bad Boys script was supposed to be for you and John Lovitz. Oh yeah, oh yeah. That's a totally different movie. Was it just like a buddy? Like, well, again, I had when I came off SNL, I was had so much heat. I had too much coming at me. Too much heat. Yeah. Do oh, you want to follow Letterman on TV Guy? Dana Carvey's going to follow Letterman. Letterman's going to leave because he didn't get the Tonight Show spot with the spot that Conan eventually did. Right. So that I thought about for a year to be a late night host. Oh yeah. I was like really close to taking that. But I then I, I'd had two kids at that point. I wasn't sure I had the personality to do four hours of TV a night and be present. I could go home, but they I'd just be so I but that was a close one. My superstar, Brad Gray was a brilliant negotiator. Yeah. So he goes, I got you a million dollars. I go, What do you mean? Well, for the NBC deal. Well, what do I have to do? I said, Yeah, I'm I'm on the fence about doing that. You don't have to do anything. You have no obligation. They're able to say that you might do it, and I got you a million dollars for that. So All I had to do you, was Brad say Gray. I was considering it. So I got a million. <laughs> everything I got, uh, those days, everything was a million, it, at least. Nothing. Oh, you can do this, it's a million. That's a million. <laughs> it was just like. So you really are a millionaire. That's good. <laughs> well, there's a little thing. When they always say celebrity net worth, I go, well, he's got 400 million. So that means he made a billion. <laughs> yeah, I right. pay taxes, right. and I pay commissions, so. Net is very different, but, you know, it's the goldfish effect that affects all of us. You put a goldfish in a small bowl, it'll grow to a certain point, won't grow anymore. Then you take it out, put it in a big bowl, it'll start growing. So it's, you know, I, I remember saying to my accountant one time, because I was making all this money and there's all this worry around it. Well, you know, we got to move this over here and we go over there. I go, well, what if, what if I pretended I was middle class? He goes, well... Then you'd be rich. <laughs> Sign me so, up for that. Can Sign I be an incredibly up. rich middle class guy <laughs> as opposed to a desperate right on the edge? <laughs> Trying every, to get on Forbes. Magazine. Everything you own owns you back. Right. I got to take this shitbox movie and this gig to pay for the ranch. Actually, nope. I just bought a house in San Diego. Yes, this is that all being said. That, that was one. from last Sunday, right? Yeah. Oh. But that that is just to put resources to play. I don't know. I, I've... I've I, I hooked up with a business manager 10 years ago. I'm not, I, I under, understand it now that business beats income. Income, I keep 35% if I'm lucky, business 65. Just we got to get into business. Yes, do. Um, well, with the last few minutes, if it's allowed, can you give us a few, what's on the horizon? Yeah, I mean, loving, I love everything that we just learned from first mm -hmm. idea, li listening to the Beatles all the way up till they're offering yeah. me jobs that I I don't even have to take. 
and I get a million. So now that yeah. you have managed your money well, your husband, your dad, you're just mm-hmm. doing your thing. What what is what is out there that you're still looking well, at? Well, right now I'm I'm having the most fun I've ever had. Uh and enjoying it the most. Um, during those formative years, when I was really wanting to be home, and a lot of people have to negotiate this, okay? You're in Hollywood, which takes your whole soul and your being, or you're on the road or you're doing a movie. You, you know, I'll be, you know, I'm home 10 days a year. Um, I did stand up on my own terms. I would take two months off at Christmas. I wouldn't work at summer. And I was being paid... Uh, enormous amounts of money to do corporate stand-up. So I I made money when I was kind of my alone years where you didn't see me much. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was making more money than most movie stars. (laughs) You know, Jay Leno took a lot of these gigs too. It was the heyday. I get it still is huge, but it's, it's not fun, but it's, it's uh, incredibly lucrative. So that's what I did during those years. Now that my sons went into show business the last five years, uh, we'd like to kind of do what you do. We had no idea. (laughs) So now I'm at the point where I just want to do stuff I control that it is me. So it's really this show that I'm doing. um, Meaning the podcast. The podcast is its own separate thing. We we intentionally did it unpartnered for a while because I didn't want to have any influence at all. So it's completely, purely what I want to do. Because... For me, um, bringing my siblings on to, to talk, people love that about our childhood. Really crazy, funny stuff that yeah. happened, mm. car trips. And so the, the, that's authentically me, that show. So when I did the Instagram Live for the Washington Post, uh, writer, I said, you know me better than anyone's ever interviewed me. So that's pure fun. I'm doing developing this show that's not out there right now with, with Conan, his company, with my sons. Very excited about that. Nice. And then um, I'm doing this animated show with Tina Fey and Robert Carlock, which uh, it's a lot of work. It was 20 episodes on Netflix, but my character is really fun and the writing's brilliant. So right now I'm not doing anything I don't want to do. I've done some Zoom corporate dates. Um, you know, those are, I've gotten that down a little bit better. I said, you have to have a guy interview me. I yeah. can't just do it to the ether. But right now I'm not tempted to do anything that's not, totally under my control there's nothing i will do uh, for the money i mean of course look if there's a corporate date in vegas i'll drive out there and do it i'd never not do those and i always go all out i'm never cynical be- if it's a theater date or a corporate date yeah i figure that's a lot of guys accept a corporate date and then are pissing and moaning and complaining i go then don't do it right but if i go there i want them to say no one's ever killed that heart that's yeah, right, my goal yeah. right <laughs> right it's a little sick <laughs> it takes so a lot no of talk of wayne's world three is what you're trying to tell us if wayne's <laughs> if someone wants to go do that with what they can do with just a little bit of de-aging i'm telling you we know the technology is there and it, if they want to it's got the a I- special it's effects guy here the Irishman. already that can help you out if they want to uh Put it. I'll put the wig on and, and, and do it. You know, party on, Wayne. Wayne, I got. I forgot to take my Flow Max. You know, <laughs> everything is middle aged medication. Garth, <laughs> duh, come on. I'm getting my arthritis shot tomorrow. <laughs> you know, but uh, those are fun characters. All they do is they just mean fun. Uh, uh, they were the losers in town. Live with their parents. Had an AMC Pacer, but they had more fun than right. anyone in the town. That's. Always a good place to be. I think uh, we can end with that. I mean, yeah. Dude. Uh, 17 hours later. Mr. Carvey. This is amazing. It was a longer story than I thought. No, I I would like to hear more of that. Thank you for coming, for sharing all that stuff with us. Pleasure. Giving us some insight into your process, how you work. Um, I think that's it. Uh, Everybody, if you uh, like what you heard today, if you're watching it on YouTube, or you're just listening it on Spotify or iTunes, uh, feel free to hit that like subscribe button um i don't know maybe leave a nice comment um i think that's it that wraps us out yeah, yeah. i'll just say i was uh <laughs> from my side of the fence the parking was easy <laughs> the directions were good uh the studio was off the charts nice oh, uh, appreciate that thank you the hosts are great uh you know i feel like i talk too much but those stories are no. so ornate uh that uh i mean you think about it like it was a pretty interesting journey that that 10 years a lot of ups and whimsical i like it because you just show failures and i don't mean to like pick on you no no yeah there's a there's a 
a rumor or an idea that you come out here and you work for six months or a year and then you make it and it's like, no, you got to fail for a decade. Yeah. And that's where you're going to yes. learn. And they used to ask, I don't know the exact quote, they would ask Walt Disney, how you doing? He goes, I've, I've, uh, I've had like 12 failures this year, meaning I'm, I'm on the right track. Mm. Yeah, and, and you might have <laughs> the one. I'm doing great. Yeah. yeah, I mean, they didn't want to make Disneyland. They thought it was a dumb idea. Like, why would we make this thing? That's not going to work at all. Yeah. And it's like the one success is what people will remember over the 10 failures it took you to get there. Yeah, you want to collect failures. You want to collect bad, you know, that's why I, I the reason I stay kind of trim is I just weigh myself every day. I just... Every time I, if I overeat or if I have a pizza, I go, wow, I'm going to, I'm going to have a failure today and I'm going to embrace it. I'm going to get on the scale and face it. So you always got to, uh, I used to, we'll do this on the next one. We'll have to have another episode. Oh, please. On you're the top. Back. Here's my Anytime last. At you're the welcome top back. of my notes, I had these yellow pads, which is bullet points, you know, mm -hmm. and I, I said, go to the fear mm -hmm. on top and big, go right to where you don't want to go. So anything you don't want to do in life, like it's a hot oven, you know, within reason, yeah, <laughs> you know, right. sometimes right. that's where exactly where you need to go because uh, that's a door that if you open it continually, eventually it'll open wide enough. You can walk in. Well, and um, that's uh, my favorite expression from somebody I respect said that what you fear determines the boundaries of your freedom. So if you fear heights, you stay low. If you fear stand up, you'll stay back. If you fear uh, success, you maybe you'll never risk. Um, and it's actually going through the fear that allows you to do the thing well, on the other side. Well, to that story, I developed and have a horrible fear of flying. Really? Yes. Well, I've done years on private jets and regular jets. I, but to your point, I've never walked a flight. I've never turned down a gig because of a flight, and I'll always fly, you know, because my wife said, let's go. This is, we'd never done a trip, just the two of us like this. Let's go to Europe for two weeks. We'll fly to London. We'll do this. So my first impulse was like, oh, I'm safe and cozy here. I don't know. I, you know, but then I, my second impulse was like, well, of course I'm going to go. Right. Because I said, right. wow, my brain is anxious and afraid. So I have to go right in. Of course I'm going. Even if I don't want to go, I'm going. Yeah. Because you, once that controls you, you know. It limits you. Slippery slope. Yeah. And, uh, you know, on my tiptoes, I can see 80. So. I mean, have fun. It goes pretty fast. <laughs> Man, uh, this is fantastic. Thank you again for being here. Fantastic and, uh, with it's, Dana it's Carvey. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah, fantastic. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. <laughs> we'll be back after this break for another seven hours. Yeah. So. <laughs> All right. We are out of here. And here is Good our night. exit music.